We're back again this week for Psalm 19, uh, the last portion of it in which we will look into special revelation. So the first six verses were about general revelation. God generally reveals himself to mankind in his created order. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In other words, God shows us himself, but again, it's not quite enough. Verse 7, the law of the Lord though, God's special revelation is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward." Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I absolutely love that passage. It's a beautiful expression about God and his special revelation. If we want to just kind of break it down quickly, we're going to see something particular about God's law or God's word, if you will, God's special revelation to his people. It is perfect and reviving. It is sure and wise making. It is right and rejoicing. It is pure and enlightening. Verses 7 and 8 kind of give that beautiful poetic march forward in which we can absolutely rejoice in the sureness and and beauty and goodness and pureness and enlightening nature of God's word. It then transitions into more of this reverential response for that word, how the fear of the Lord is clean. Now let's take it just a few seconds to kind of break down the fear of the Lord is clean. Many people don't think of the fear of the Lord is clean. Why would we have to be scared of God? This is not speaking of being scared of God. This is a settled assurance that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. And God says two things. I will bless you if you follow me by faith and I will curse you if you follow your own way. And when we fear God, we reckon that he is going to keep good with his promises. And it says that the fear of the Lord is clean, and the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Many people consider the Word of God as nothing more than mythology and folklore and, and kind of, well, if it's good for you, great, but it's not great for me. Uh, when we look at this, it says intrinsically by itself it is pure and good and true and righteous altogether. In verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. In other words, there is a great blessing that can be had in the fact that we lust after God's word. We want it. It is sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant has warned. God's word warns us and it blesses us. There's a bitter sweetness to it at times in which God absolutely gives it to us as something that is wonderfully desirable. And our servant is kept by them. And great is the reward in following in their light. He then transitions in this last part to the response of the reader of God's special revelation. We stand and we look in the created order and we see generally speaking that God is there and we worship. But when we read God's special revelation, there is a, a particular contrition that happens when the psalmist expresses it here. He says, who can discern his errors? The word of God is piercing and sharp. Who can discern this? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. He begins to beg God because the word has been a mirror to his soul. Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. God's word helps mankind to recognize who he is in relationship to who God and our need of God. And look at the 
psalmist's immediate place of coming before God, asking for God's grace. Let these sins not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless because God has answered his prayer. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And then he wraps it all up with a beautiful prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As David went through this, I can imagine he is rejoicing in the great and beautiful expression of God's creation and how God has revealed in it. And he's rejoicing in the great and beautiful expression of God's law and how good it is. And then he comes to himself and he sees himself to be who he is. And he comes with a repentant, faith-filled response. And he says, oh God, bless the meditation of my heart. Bless the words of my mouth. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God bless you. We'll see you next time.